We're just about to start YouTube, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Looking forward to hearing about all of these authors, to say the least. Good morning, everybody. We are now at our 1030 Wednesday study We're session. To start you. I, we haven't given a name to it yet. Uh, anybody have any idea? We should have probably done it now that we've been doing it for like five months. Uh, the name of it is, we're, we're very creative with names, Wednesday Study Session. <laughs> Works and for me. Each week we decide what we're going to study the, for the next week. And so what we decided for this week is we're going to start studying Jewish authors. And obviously the numbers are so enormous that we can only really choose a few. We're going to do two sessions. Uh, originally, we had it scheduled also for next week. I am going to cancel the next two classes so we can get ready, two or three, so I can get ready for Yom Kippur. Uh, just gives us a little bit more time. And then we'll, we'll start that afterwards again. So I apologize to everybody who's supposed to talk about their author. So what we did is we chose author. Anybody who wants to choose another author, we invite them. We have a list of people who are going to do it today. And so uh not everybody's on this on this yet so we'll go through uh with people who are on and hopefully and if you haven't finished no worries but uh we have i know harriet is on and she is going to talk about one of the most famous obviously is chaim potak and uh, uh harriet are you good to do that today yes all right let's hear about chaim to, okay. or, or to what his friends call him, Jaime, but that was only for close friends like me. Harriet, 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 yes. Harriet, Harriet, yes. can I ask, could you set it a little closer to the mic? Sure. Is that better? <laughs> a little bit, yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, he's an interesting guy. Um, he was born February 17th, 1929 in Bronx, New York. Uh, his parents, um, Benjamin and Molly, were Jewish immigrants from Poland. And his father was a, a, a jeweler and watchmaker. And uh, the family was Orthodox. And um, he was the oldest of four children. And let me see which way I have to go. Uh, he was the oldest of four children, um, and all of the children or uh, either became rabbis or married rabbis. Um, his, he was born Herman Harold Potok, but his uh, Hebrew name was Chaim, and so he actually officially changed his name to Chaim Potok. Um, he was brought up with an Orthodox Jewish education, at, uh, if anyone uh, is interested, at the Marcia Stern Talmudic Academy, which is uh, Yeshiva University's boys' high school, uh, well, boys' schools. Um, and he, he finished there um, through high school. Um, when he was in his teens, he read a book called Brides Had Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. And he was so um, impressed with it that he decided to become a writer. Um, at 16, he began to write fiction and he was much influenced by the book Brideshead. At 17, he made his first submission to the Atlantic Monthly. It was not published, but he received a note from the editor complimenting his work. He attended Yeshiva University and um, in 1949, um, he was published, uh, his stories were published in the Yeshiva University magazine, which he also helped edit. So I suppose that that was convenient for him. Um, he, got, he graduated uh, summa cum laude in 1950 with a degree, uh, with a BA in English literature. Then he went to, for four years, to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, and he was ordained a conservative rabbi. He was appointed director of the LTF, which was the Leaders Training Fellowship, a youth organization affiliated with conservative Judaism. After earning a master's degree in, uh, in English literature, he enlisted in the US Army as a chaplain. He served in South Korea from 1957, 1955 to 1957. It transformed him. 
growing up in an Orthodox community, he was very sheltered, and uh, he believed that only the uh, Jews were really fervent in their prayers. And um, he found out that um, when he was in South Korea, uh, where there were no Jews, uh, other than himself and a couple of others, um, that the people prayed with the same fervor as the Orthodox synagogues at home. Uh, when he returned to the States, he joined the faculty of the University of, Ju uh, of Judaism in LA. Uh, he met his future wife, Adina Nisera Mozavitsky, at Camp Ramah in Ojai, California, where he was camp director from 1957 to 1959. He and Adina got married in 1958, and in 1959, he started his graduate studies not that he didn't have graduate studies already, uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he and Adina um, had three children. Uh, Rina was one of them, and uh, Nayama and Akiva. He was appointed scholar in residence at Temple Har Zion in uh, Philadelphia. In 1963, the Potoks were instructors at Camp Ramont in Nyack, New York. They moved later in 1963 to Israel for a year when he wrote his doctoral uh, dissertation on uh, someone by the name of Solomon Maimon. Um, he was a Lithuanian. Um, he got married at 11. Uh, and the reason why was because his family was very poor and he was identified as uh, this uh, Solomon was identified as a prodigy, a Talmudic prodigy. And so his parents uh, wanted him to have the benefit of continuing his school. Uh, so they, uh, they actually went after two different rich uh, young ladies. And um, at 11, he married one of them and was able to continue his, his studies. Um, and uh, he, uh, well, Solomon was a different story. You know, we can just leave him for another time. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, he began to write a novel. In 1964, a year later, they moved back to Brooklyn. Chaim became the managing editor of the magazine Conservative Judaism and joined the faculty of the Teachers Institute of the Jewish Theological Seminary. In 1965, he became editor-in-chief of the Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia, and later chairman of the publication committee. During this time, he received his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. In 1970, the Potox returned to Israel and relocated to Jerusalem. In 1977, they returned to Philadelphia. So they spent seven years in, in Israel. In 1967, he published his first novel, The Chosen, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for 39 weeks, selling over 3.4 million copies. It won the Edward Lewis Wallant Award, and I looked that up and I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and he was also nominated for, the book was also nominated for the National Book Award, but did not win that year. The movie was released uh, the Chosen in 1981, and it won the most prestigious award at the World Film Festival in Montreal. Um, and in that movie, Pochak has a cameo role as a professor. His parents discouraged his writing and reading of non-Jewish subjects. So he often spent hours in the library, however, um, reading secular authors. And he often quoted many of them in his literary, you know, they were his chief literary influences, such as Hemingway, Joyce, Thomas Mann, Dostoevsky. Um, Potok had had a great influence on Jewish American authors. His work was significant in discussing the conflict between traditional aspects of Ju um, Judaism and uh, thought and culture and modernization to a uh, wider non-Jewish culture. He taught postmodernism at the University of Pennsylvania from 1993 to 2001. 
Um, in 2000, he was in April of 2000, he was uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor and uh, he lived for another little over two years. Um, he died at the age of 73, but during this time, he um, dictated a novel to his wife uh, because he was no longer able to write, but he obviously, even with the brain tumor, had clear thinking. Um, he bequeathed all of his correspondence and papers and memorabilia to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the only book of his, he wrote 18 books, and the only book of his um, that was not about uh, a male protagonist was uh, Davida's Heart. Um, and um, I, anyway, he did, along the way, he did write 18 books. I think that uh, this man accomplished a tremendous amount in life, including having three children <laughs> and moving all of them, you know, moving back and forth between Israel and different places in the United States because he was in LA and Brooklyn and, you know, uh, and such. So um, he was really um, a very busy man. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've all probably read at least one, if not several, of his novels. Uh -huh. Chosen is one of the few movies where the movie is almost as good as the book. So, uh, uh -huh. Larry, do you want to say something or had a question? And you're on mute. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, um, part of my 15 minutes of fame was when I did get to introduce Chaim Potuk at a fundraiser at Lake Hiawatha Jewish Center many, many, many years ago. I was chairman of adult ed at the time, and uh, we decided to have a major fundraiser, and it happened to coincide with a couple of big events. One was the year that uh, his book, Asha Lev, which came after The Chosen, came out. And um, the second was the, uh, well, I'll tell about that later. But so I got to introduce him. I got to make all the arrangements, unfortunately, in you know, the logistics of bringing him in from Philadelphia by car. He insisted on a private chauffeur and a private car, and he, we paid him an enormous amount of money at the time, like $1,500, but we did make quite a bit of money in the fundraiser because we had a reception with him beforehand where he signed the books uh, that we bought from him. <laughs> so he was quite a financier or an entrepreneur at the time. But um, just getting back to what Harriet said, uh, uh, I kind of moderated the discussion, uh, panel discussion or uh, afterwards, and a couple of highlights came to mind that uh, uh, about, um, you know, uh, what he had said that evening. And he specifically mentioned Evelyn War and Brideshead Revisited, which happened to be a TV series at the time. Obviously, it's based on the book. And um, he basically said that uh, when he first read it, um, as a child, which was thought to be a frivolous kind of thing from an orthodox family going to read uh, secular novels, as Harriet mentioned, um, that uh, he felt more at home with the Catholic family and he knew them better from Brideshead Revisited based on the writings of Evelyn War, British writer, uh, than he really felt it sometimes with his own family. And that was, he felt like one of the real turning points in making him uh, look toward literature. Um, his novels that he decided on uh, are really based on um, what he calls a cataclysmic event that takes place when you have two worlds that are colliding, the world of the ultra-Orthodox with the world of the secular. And you see that in The Chosen, where the kid is a his father wants him to be a rabbi, and yet he also has these ambitions of going to college and maybe being, you know, a mathematician or something else, and the turmoil that takes place. And you see that even more in, in Asher Lev with the artist and things of that nature. So I remember that quite vividly that, you know, he spoke about this turmoil that takes place between these two worlds of people that are searching for something that are caught in the, not as they caught, but they don't mean that degenerate. Uh, but in, in a world that they've grown up in, and yet they, they have to move into a different world. But in a way, he's responsible for my interest in Woody Allen, because at the end of, uh, during the talk, when I moderated it, someone had said to, asked the question, and they said, um, uh, Dr. Potok, what do you think of the Academy Award winning film Annie Hall that year? And he said, I loved it. And he went on to tell the last joke that's in the story about you know, the chickens and we all need chickens. You know, why do you take, you know, with your brother? Because why do you, you put up with your brother? Well, we all need chickens, even though he's crazy, we need the eggs. Um, 
And I had watched that movie, but I'd watched it kind of casually. And even after then, uh, I started to pay a lot more attention to films. So in a way, I credit him with my interest in, in, in films and in particular in Woody Allen. So that was my 15 minutes of fame with uh, Ryan with Potok. Actually, I had uh, thought before I, uh, uh, I researched him uh, that um, I, my name is Asher Lev was, uh, was his second book, but actually he did have a book in between called The Promise. Um, right, um, yeah, uh, what did you say? I you read that? It. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, prior to that, he also, uh, from 1964 to 1969, he also published four, a 14 volume collection of Jewish ethics. So that was really his first writing. But during that time when he was doing that, he was also writing The Chosen and um, The Promise. That's very interesting. And we'll go on to the next, but thank you. I'm here. I have a question. Be... Sure, Michael. Did, did, did he remain an Orthodox Jew throughout his life? Uh, no, he, he was a, a conservative rabbi. Oh, he was a conservative rabbi, but I mean, but okay, but he did continue to. Yeah, but okay. he, he definitely leaned toward what I call conservative docs. Uh, yeah, his his practices, right, yeah. as far as I could tell from the brief conversation, at least yeah. at the time of Asher left, he may have changed yeah. afterwards. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting if you watch the movie and read the book, um, The Chosen. One of the slight differences is in the movie, the friend uh, is studying to be an, a, a conservative rabbi, but in the book. He's actually studying to be a modern Orthodox rabbi. So the book is more about modern Orthodoxy in many ways and secularism, uh, unlike My Name is Asher Lev, which is completely. So it was really interesting that you can go several ways that he was a rabbi, part of the conservative movement. We tried to bring him into the right movement. He never came in, but uh, he, he's definitely one of all of our favorites. So thank you very much, Harry. There's a lot I didn't know there. So let's, let's go to uh, Flossie next. And Flossie, you're going to do another of the major. Most of the ones we're doing are major, but obviously anyone who wins a Nobel Prize is 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 way up there, if not higher. So you're, I believe you're speaking about Ellie Wiesel, right? And you're on mute, just to let you know, Flossie. I just want to say that um, when he donated all of his uh, memorabilia and uh, letters that had been written to him, Ellie Wiesel, uh, had written a letter um, that the University of Pennsylvania now owns um, to him, telling him how he has enjoyed uh, all of his books. Oh, uh, his books are so brilliant. They're so much fun. They're so, I think, yeah, there, yeah. I'm surprised. I wish you, I wish you decided to do it to JTS or UJ, which is now the JT, I forgot the new acronym, JTA. Flo uh, Flossie, what, what would you like to tell us about Ellie Wiesel? Before I start that, I just want to make a mention. If I'm sure you know Rabbi, and if several of my friends here are Hadassah members, in the Hadassah magazine this month, there's a whole article on Savannah. You all <laughs> help me get. <laughs> there's a beautiful article on our mikveh Israel. Yeah, we're gonna. I'll be put in the archives. I think it's on Facebook and. Yeah, my it was really, it's yeah, a it's, a great, it's a really nice article. That they they that was from a long time ago. To the interviews apparently were like last year. And a quick aside, everyone will like this. I have a friend in New Jersey who wrote me and said, you know, I just read an article about this uh, synagogue, Mikvah Israel in Savannah. Have you ever gone there? <laughs> well, I wrote her back and I said, gone there, I belong there. <laughs> so she said, I hope to travel in the Netherlands let's see, in a several months, can I visit? So she'll be going. The interesting okay. thing is, it will, after that article in Hadassah, it'll be interesting to see if it gives the uh, temple a membership boost. <laughs> That'd be great. In fact, it's, it's such, it was such a great artist. It convinced me to, that I decided I need to be married to somebody who's not only a member of Hadassah, but a president of her local chapter. So that's, so that's well, how my wife is now. I just president. had to bring it up. I found it very interesting. Um, Elie Wiesel, 1928 to 2016. 
He was born in Siget, S-I-G-H-E-T, Romania. He's known as a writer, a professor, a political activist, a Nobel laureate, and a Holocaust survivor. He authored 57 books, and most of them were written in French and English. At 15, he was deported with his family to Auschwitz Buchenwald concentration camp. With his father, he and his whole family was sent there. His father and his youngest sister perished there. Um, interesting, his older sisters, Beatrice and Hilda survived. After liberation, he lived in France in an orphanage, then became a journalist, and he moved to Israel and then the United States in 1963. In 1958, at the age of 29, he published his memoir, Night. Night is an account of a 15-year-old, it's semi-fictional construction, told by a mature Ellie. He allows this 15-year-old to tell the story from post-Holocaust perspective. And this I found very interesting. Until the book Night came out, and like I said, 1958, the horrors of the Holocaust had barely been given public words. So it's one of the first books that actually told about the Holocaust and what people went through. It had a profound input on global memory of the Holocaust. Night was originally published in Yiddish, then it was written in French, and then it was translated to over 30 different languages. He has a trilogy, it's called Night, Dawn, and Day. In 1961, he wrote Dawn, which is mainly fictional, but it gives his thoughts on the Holocaust and what he went through. And in 1962, he wrote Day, which gives thoughts completely after the Holocaust. In 1978, he was appointed chairman of the President's Commission on the Holocaust by President Carter. He was the driving force behind the establishment of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. On stepping down from the chairmanship in 1986, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize and the head of the committee, quote, called him a messenger to mankind. His message was one of peace, atonement and human dignity. He and his wife, Marion, established the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1992, in 2009 National Humanities Medal, Lifetime Literary Achievement Award in 2000, um, President Obama on his death said, you know, I'm saying this, but he's not dead yet in my book, but my article, but one of the great moral voices of our time, and in many ways, the conscience of mankind. Um, I can mention many of his books, but I don't think we have that much time, Rabbi, that we know him mainly with Night Dawn and Some of You Day, um, A Beggar in Jerusalem, The Gates of the Forest. Um, something else that's very interesting. Uh, he's known for many of his quotes. And I have heard him speak on this, and I think this says it all. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. The opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. Friendship marks a life even more deeply than love. 
We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages a tormentor, never the tormented. He was married to Marion. They had one child. And I feel the main thing about Welly, Ellie Wiesel is in his books, you're living the experiences with him. I read Night so many years ago, and it's like I read it just yesterday, the power that is there. And when Larry mentioned meeting Heim Potok, one of my claims <laughs> of fame was, I met Ellie Wiesel and Jeff will tell you, I've read many of his books and I, I when he was speaking also Larry, in Parsippany area, I got so excited and went to see him. And I can say the one thing about him that as I got the book and waiting in line for him to sign it, his eyes, they're the most powerful eyes you can imagine. They tell so much. They're almost like mirrors to the soul. You've heard that saying that when I walked away, I kept saying to Jeff, those eyes, they go right through you. And um, I, I hope you got the feeling of with his writings, what he wrote, he must have harbored for several years, having lived and he went to Auschwitz at 15. So much of what he saw and experienced, and you could see it took him almost 10 years to write Night, which was his memoir. But the world is better with his books and knowing when we have deniers and have people around who won't admit to what happened, here is definite proof of what was experienced. Well, again, thank you so much. You know, the first two we've listened to are both who've been alive during my lifetime. So I had the pleasure of hearing both of them speak at different times. I imagine many of us have, but Ellie was you know, certainly one of the most powerful. Uh, Larry, and then we'll go to Stuart. Thank you so much, Flossie. And Larry, you're on mute. Oh, uh, sorry, Jeff, did you want to say something? Yes, I just wanted to add a footnote. Um, I was wondering if you were going to mention that. When we heard Ellie Wiesel oh, speak, oh, I, I forgot about that. It was so powerful, so sincere, and so emotional. And then at the end, he had a question and answer period. Oh, yeah. And we were at a university, I believe. Yeah, uh, well, right, wherever. We anyway, a university student stood up and said, he. Basically, it was a real eye opener because he came out with straight Holocaust denial. He asked Ellie Wiesel how he could talk about all these lies about what happened in the Holocaust, and none of this was true. And you know, he went on for about two minutes, and then the audience couldn't handle it anymore. But Ellie Wiesel. It was very interesting what he said. He said, I won't even deem what you said, you know, what you said doesn't even- Isn't worth an answer. Worth an answer from me. Um, you know, and, and then the guy just got up and left. And a young man, maybe 20, 19, yeah, but- I, I remember him today, and it was, like Thank I said, a real eye-opener. And I, I still have a picture of his image, a redhead. And, you know, anyway, just a side note, I, I certainly remember that and how emotional you get when you read the books. But there are people out there, none of this happened, despite the incredible number of witnesses and the impeccable German records. And the other question is, why do they care so much that it didn't exist? Yeah. I mean, what is, why do they care? You know, uh, I, I'm sorry, just Jeff? Want, just, just another quick um, footnote is that, uh, in, am I muted? 
Yeah. Now, I'm going to go back to Jeff. Jeff hadn't finished. Jeff, you were saying one more thing. I'm sorry. I I interrupted. Oh, it, it, it's interesting that in Germany, Holocaust denial is a felony offense. And that famous uh, English writer, when he went to Germany and happened to make a speech before a, um, a uh, German ultra-right um, neo-Nazi type group, where he ended up denying the Holocaust, he got arrested right after that and spent the ne next six months in jail until he recanted. He was later involved in a famous li uh, libel trial, but very interesting. It's a scary thing, but it's not to me again, it's not the fact that they don't believe it existed. It's the fact that they have to go out of their way just to prove it. It means so much to them, which is really shows it's, you know, anti-Semitically laced. And we'll finish this one with Larry so much, and then we'll go to Stuart. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, uh, it reminded me that um, we were part of a book club and we read one, in addition to reading, you know, many of his books about the Holocaust, he also wrote a very, very fine, small volume about the prophets. And his insight, I thought, into the prophets was really extraordinary into uh, providing additional uh, thoughts and, uh, and comments on them. And it's something that um, I'd like to revisit. I have the book back in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, um, so he did write, uh, you know, on other subjects as well, not as famously, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful small volume. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, the prophets, of course, a lot of people are the center of Judaism, especially after the Holocaust, because of the ethical nature of their life. So um, thank you very much. So we've heard Potok and we've also done obviously uh, Elie Wiesel. And so now we're gonna invite um, um, Stuart to talk about Joseph Telushkin who is not as well known, but certainly a very famous contemporary writer. And in the Jewish world, very well known. And Stuart, you are on mute, just to let you know. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Yeah, no. uh, yeah. Uh, Telushkin is going to be a little bit surprising to many. Uh, I call him uh, a rabbi, obviously, a writer, both of fiction and nonfiction. And I think the fiction's a little surprised to some people. Uh, listed as one of the best and most requested lecturers in the United States and a humorist. So he's uh, pretty much got it all. I first encountered uh, Telushkin's work when I was taking a leadership institute at the congregation uh, Aguda Fahim in Atlanta. And those of us who completed the course were given a volume of Telushkin. So that was my uh, first episode with him. He's written 16 books. Uh, I have six or seven of them, and they are really very interesting. Uh, just a little background on him. Uh, he was brought up in an Orthodox family and indeed got his smicha, became a rabbi at the... Uh, uh, I jotted it down somewhere. Uh, JTS, I believe it was. Uh, which is conservative, and he's currently the rabbi of the Los Angeles Synagogue for the Performing Arts, hmm. which is not what one would expect, and actually is there twice a month. That's in LA. He, however, lives in New York uh, with his wife, and they say with his four children, but his four children are not so little anymore, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, in terms of background, he was, uh, his father, Shlomo, was a rabbi, but more importantly, in a sense, or more interestingly, was an accountant. <laughs> and his primary client was someone named uh, Menashe Mendel Schneerson, that is, the Rebbe of the Chabad movement. Uh, and as a matter of fact, his father, Shlomo, was... Uh, also the accountant for the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe as well. He started as the accountant for the Lubavitcher Rabbi all the way back in 1946. Whether he was uh, accountant for the movement 
is hard to say because the I don't yeah, you know, the Rebbe there is so intertwined with the movement that I'm not sure how you can be the accountant for one without the other. But there's a strong connection there. So strong indeed that when the people wanted to have a uh, biography of the Rebbe Schneerson written, he only would agree to do it if Telushkin was the author of that biography. Uh, so that to me was, was interesting. Shlomo and his, uh, Tolu Joseph Telushkin's mother, Helen, came to the United States right after World War II in about 1946. Telushkin has been called by the New York Jewish Week, America's rabbi, and I think that's a very, very uh, appropriate title for him. He's one of the folks whose references you would go to when you have almost any question about Judaism and don't have a rabbi uh, handy. Uh, I think the other one's name is Kolach, who has written on the same thing. It seems to me that Telushkin really wrote in four or five different areas. Oh, uh, let me just give a little background before that. Uh, he currently tours U.S. He was very, very active in towards Soviet Jewry when he was in college, particularly he was a member and a leader of what was then called the Soviet struggle for Soviet Jewry. Jewry. Uh, went to Russia quite a few times and was very familiar and had met most of the dissidents like Solzhenitsyn, whose names we are familiar with. He was so active, in fact, that he was listed by the KGB as an anti-Russian agent. His writings fall into, to my mind, a number of characters, uh, categories. Uh, the first of them, I would say, are about Jewish writings, books on Jewish literacy, biblical literacy, uh, nine questions for, about Judaism was another one, uh, Why the Jews, which he co-wrote with Dennis Prager, another well-known rabbi who was a student with Telushkin uh, early on at the Flatbush Yeshiva. Uh, the Flatbush Yeshiva in Brooklyn, it turns out, was about four blocks from where I was brought up. Uh, although, <laughs> I hate to say it, at 72, he was much younger than I. Uh, the second category are books that I would classify as self-help books. Words that hurt, words that heal, for example. Uh, and uh, in that same broad area, uh, you know, the, the self-help kinds of, of books. Uh, I would almost include in that his book on Jewish values, which is one that uh, I use and I read weekly. And the reason I read it weekly is that's the way he wrote it. It's got 365 chapters, one for each day of the week in the year. Uh, and he'll cover a topic uh, on it. Some Thing about Jewish values or Jewish ethics with on six days giving little exercises for the six days. For example, what should you do when you have hear an ambulance going by? And much of us have the reaction uh, somewhere along the line, anywhere from a shrug to, oh boy, I'm glad it's not me. His idea is that when you hear that, maybe what you should do is say a little prayer that the person on the receiving end of this ambulance visit should uh, be well and do well. Yeah. Going at that way, and he presents that as a Jewish value. The seventh day of each week uh, is Shabbos, and he asks for the seventh day, it's always the same chapter, uh, which is think about what we have studied the previous week and think about how you're going to implement these lessons. Uh, third category are biographies. Uh, I was aware of Rebbe, which is probably his most recent book, uh, but also he wrote a biography of Hillel, 
And for those, some of you may know the name Yitzch Greenberg uh, very well. My rabbi, he also did a biography of Yitzch Greenberg. Uh, the fourth I call Jewish culture, uh, a very well-known, excellent book on Jewish humor, quite funny. Uh, with it, It's sort of, uh, what was it, Joe Brown's joke book? in a sense, but he talks about how Jewish humor reflects Judaism in general and Jewish values. Another one called Uncommon Sense and four murder mysteries, strictly fiction. I think people aren't generally aware of that. In each of these, the protagonist, the leading character is a rabbi who has a sideline, just goes around uh, solving crimes. Uh, and the last of these that I'll mention, and it surprised me a little bit, was actually that he has written a, Hag a Haggadah for Passover. And I don't know why that surprised me, uh, but it did. He's also, and you may not know it, but if any of you used to watch the television series with Della Reese called Touched by an Angel, which I hated, <laughs> that was my personal view, he wrote a television script for one of the episodes in that, available on YouTube, and the script is called Bar, Bar Mitzvah, and stars a post-stroke Kirk Douglas. And it's really an interesting script. It would be interesting to watch on YouTube. I watched it recently because there are so many what I will call Telushkinisms in the script. Even if you, if you were familiar with Telushkin and you saw the script without knowing that he had a writing credit on it, you would know that it was either written by him or someone who was heavily influenced by his writings. Uh, so all in all, I would say that he is probably, certainly within the Jewish community, one of the most influential and important uh, Jewish writers of the modern day. And is used in so many ways for reference books to any, I mean, he is today, today such an icon in the Jewish world. And uh, it's really, I don't know, has everybody heard of him? Some of you may not have. He's not as well known outside the Jewish world as, as Elie Witzel or Chaim Potok, but uh, one of the preeminent writer rabbis around. And yes, I am also the 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 basis for his crime fighting rabbi detective rabbi in case you were wondering it oh okay a, uh, just two oops these are bad yeah, yeah i have yeah. i have both of them i don't have jewish literacy because I, I give it every time i get a copy i end up giving it to somebody yeah notice what happens here is that uh you know because of his judaism at least on my screen uh you have to read this from right to left instead of left to right is it reversed on your screen also? It's perfect. Oh, on my monitor, it's backwards. So these are two of them. Uh, and they're just all over the place. They are wonderful reads. Available, by the way, I think for the most part in the Bluffton Library. And also now because of uh, the internet book yeah. sources, these books like the Telushkin book, I used to not recommend too often because it was like $50 or more. But because of the internet booksellers, all the prices have gone down and you can't use versions as well. So it's uh, if you can't afford that. So really preeminent rabbi, again, thank you so much. So it turns out that uh, two of the writers have been rabbis. The third one was, you know, obviously Ali was out. So we're going to continue and thank you very much. And we're going to go to Rena and then we'll go to Larry. And then we'll go to Michael. You're on. Thank you. And so, Rena, we have you uh, teaching about Herman Woke. Is that correct? Let me make sure I got that right. And you're still on uh, mute, Rena. And Flossie, did you want to add something? I just want to say something to what Stu said. Stu, we had the pleasure of meeting Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. And he another was, great one. I was going to say he was amazing. He did more to break down barriers before be, 
because of the different groups of Jews and how I'm talking years ago, Rabbi, and for an Orthodox rabbi, he was so impressive with his reaching out to the reform and the conservative group. We spent a weekend, well, with him at a conference and he was wonderful, so impressed. And his wife too, Lou Greenberg, that she was very, but we've heard of him and met him and know him. So when Stu mentioned him, we thought. I am not, um matter ever seen uh, Rabbi Tolushkin, obviously not yet Greenberg. I think he, he was living, he was living during my lifetime. He didn't die that long ago. How long? Who did? Uh, I don't know when he died. 70s? I don't know. Um, so we'll go to okay. Rena now and we'll learn a little bit about another Jewish writer who uh, in many ways became more famous in the outside world and in the Jewish world in, in some cases, but one of the great all-time writers uh, as well. So we're really starting off with some big hitters there. So Rena. Okay, Rabbi. First of all, I have to apologize. I screwed up. I had Leon Uris. Okay, then I, you, you do Leon Uris. Leon Uris is perfect. Right. So uh, I do apologize. Now, I looked up a, all over the place. I don't have a lot about his personal life. For some reason, I look if you still want to hear it, you know, whatever I found. Um, you find whatever you found, we want to hear. Right, because um, I had looked at several places and uh, they were the same about him. So um, I'll just do what I have, if that's okay. Um, he was born in Baltimore, Maryland, the son of uh, Jewish American parents, Wolf William and Anna May Bloomberg. Uh, his father was a Polish-born immigrant, a paper hanger, then a storekeeper. His mother was a first-generation Russian-American. Um, he spent a year, the dad, in Palestine after World War I before entering the United States. He derived his name from Yerushalami, meaning man of Jerusalem. That was his dad, okay? Um, Yuris said of his father later on, I think his personality was formed by the harsh realities of being a Jew in Tsarist Russia. I think failure formed his character, made him bitter. Okay. At age six, Yuris reportedly wrote an operetta inspired by the death of his dog. He attended schools in Norfolk, Virginia and Baltimore, but never graduated from high school and failed English three times, which shocked me. This particular <laughs> about him just shocked me. When he was 17, uh, in his senior year of high school, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. He served in South Pacific with the second battalion, sixth Marine, where he was stationed in New Zealand and fought as a radio man in combat on Guadalcanal and Tarawa. From 1942 to 1944, he was sent to the United States suffering from dengue, fever, malaria, and a recurrence of asthma. That made him miss his battalion's dissemination at Saipan that featured in Battle Cry, one of his books. While recuperating from malaria in San Francisco, he met Betty Beck, a Marine Sergeant, and they married in 1945. Uh, coming out of the service, he worked for a newspaper, writing in his spare time, Esquire magazine, bought an article in 1950, and he began to devote his time to writing more seriously. Uh, drawing on the experiences in Guadalcanal and Tarawa, he produced the best-selling Battle Cry, a novel depicting the toughness and courage of U.S. Marines in the Pacific. He then went to Warner Brothers in Hollywood to help write the movie which was extremely popular with the public. And then he went on to write Angry Hills, a novel set in wartime Greece. His best known work may be Exodus, which was published in 1958. Most sources indicate that Eurus, motivated by intense, is, intense interest in Israel, financed his research for the novel by selling the film rights in advance to MGM and by writing a newspaper article about the Sinai campaign. It is also said that the book involved two years of research and involved thousands of interviews. 
according to Jack Shaheen, Americans were largely apathetic about Israel in the 1950s. So the eminent public relations consultant, Edward Gottlieb, was called to create a more sympathetic attitude toward the newly established state. He therefore sent Leon Uris to Israel to write a novel which became the bestseller Exodus. Introducing film goes the Arab conflict and people with this heroic Israelis and sleazy, brutal Arabs, some of who link with the ex-Nazis. Now, um, I know you all know what Exodus was about, so I'm not going to, you know, read all about it. Um, it was translated into a dozen languages, of course. Um, then he wrote in 1967, Topaz, what, it was adopted for the screen, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. And I'm just gonna mention, I mean, what he wrote was, he was so prolific. He wrote Miller 18 about the Warsaw Ghetto, ghetto Uprising, uh, Armageddon, uh, a novel of Berlin, which chronicle ends with the lifting of the Berlin blockade in 1949, pardon me and uh, uh, Trinity about Irish nationalism and the sequel redemption, redemption, excuse me, covering the early 20th century and World War I, uh, about the role of a Polish doctor in a German concentration camp. Uh, he wrote The Hague, which was a history of the Middle East. And he wrote screenplays, Battle Cry, Gun uh, Fight at OK Corral, his work on is a subject for Israel has been criticized, biased against Arabs, and it might have been, it might have been. Now, just his personal life, there's not too much. He married three times. His first wife was Betty Beck, and then he married Marjorie Edwards in 1968. She committed suicide by gunshot following year. His third and last wife was photographer Jill Peabody, daughter of Francis Gleason and Alfred Peabody of Boston. They had two children, Rachel and Connor. Um, he and his wife, Jill, worked together on his book, Ireland, A Terrible Beauty, for which he provided illustrations, and on Jerusalem, A Song of Songs. They divorced in 1988, and Uris settled in New York City. So basically, Leon died of kidney failure at his Long Island home on Shelter Island in 2003, who was only 78. His papers can be found at the Harry Ransom Center, University of Texas in Austin, where the University of Texas Press published a literary biography about him. The collection includes all of Uris's novels with the exception of The Hay and Mithla Pass, as well as manuscripts for the screenplay play Gunfight at OK Corral. Uh, he was survived by his five children and two grandchildren. So I wish I could have known more about him, but I'll tell you one thing, he was so prolific and he wrote so many screenplays for movies. Um, and I personally, his books were amazing. Again, that's, but that's all I could really find out about him. So. That's a lot. <laughs> Thank you, that's a pretty good, good summation. Um, Stu. Yeah, uh, two other things of interest. Jill Peabody, who was one of these Boston Brahmins. As a matter of fact, she was educated in the same place that Caroline Kennedy was, for example. Uh, was converted before they were married. And although they were married in, you know, what seems, the, you know, the Algonquin Hotel, which is fitting for her social status, they were married by a rabbi and she actually converted before that marriage. Uh, so he did maintain his Judaism, even though he started moving well off Jewish topics in a lot of what he did, uh, like Trinity and like O.K. Corral. The other thing was that as a writer, he was really noted for his research so that uh, his books tend to be even though they're historical novels, tend to be very, very accurate in terms of the history involved. Uh, legend has it that he did over 2,000 interviews, for example, in preparing to write Exodus. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, and again, another one who's you know, become very, very well known in the Jewish world. I did not realize he wrote Gunfight, 
a gunfight at the OK Corral till just now. So that's pretty, who was also starred for the second time we talk about Kirk Douglas. But again, every time you talk about anything Jewish, you got to mention Kirk Douglas. Yeah. And so it's kind of a rule. You mean Isha Danielovich? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, or okay. Izzy, I just want to make sure it, we put that same person. Izzy, Izzy to his friends. Right. So thank you. And again, Leon, you're again another person who his Jewish novels have become very famous and some of them they're just so well written. I, I love the, the one, the Hajj, for some reason, I just, about the, the early pioneers in Israel and how they learned to protect themselves is really, but Exodus of course is the most important and most famous by far, but uh, such a great, great one. All right, so we're gonna go on. Thank you so much. We'll do uh, Larry and if we have time, we'll do Michael. And if not, we'll do Michael next time. Yeah, well, Arthur Miller. Uh, luckily, Arthur Miller is a guy who likes to be interviewed. And if you <laughs> go on YouTube, you could see an enormous number of interviews. And maybe one of these days, I'll show one of his short interviews that, uh, um, uh, which, which I think reveals quite a bit about him in a short period of time. But there's an enormous uh, number of times that he had been interviewed over his life. And he had quite a, um, an interesting life. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a little movie discussion group here in New Jersey and South Carolina people came in as well. And uh, one of the movies that we were watching was called An Enemy of the People, uh, which is an Ibsen play. Um, and I see uh, Jeff is shaking his head because he had seen it uh, and we discussed it. Um, and what is interesting about Miller is that his life is really revealed so much in his plays. And the plays uh, that we're so familiar with, The Crucible and Death of a Salesman and All My Sons, a lot of that really is, um, I wouldn't say autobiographical, but it's really based on his feelings and uh, it portrays his life probably more than anybody, uh, many, many other authors do. Uh, so you can reveal it. Um, I happened to be in the library a couple of weeks ago um, and I picked up this book of Arthur Miller, which was basically his plays. And it's interesting because in this anthology of his plays, they do wrote, he did write many screenplays as well. He wrote the screenplay for the, uh, the version of The Crucible. He wrote a screenplay for um, Death of a Salesman, uh, but he adapted one of the screenplays to, for Ibsen's play, Enemy of the People. Now, Enemy of the People, is a, Ibsen's a Norwegian playwright, and um, he was thought to be um, uh, one of the real realists at the time. And Enemy of the People, is about a, um, a town in Norway and um, their main source of income in the town is tourism and they're, um, uh, um, uh, they find the doctor in the town who happens to be the brother of the um, mayor of the town. Um, they find that the, the uh, spring from which uh, they're deriving most of their spas and tourism is polluted and very, very dangerous. And the doctor reveals um, this to his brother, and he says, we've got to close the spa down. And from this becomes the, um, the, the, the crux of the story between um, the scientific purposes of the brother and the economic purposes of the town. And he becomes an enemy of the people for trying to reveal the truth. And um, Ibsen's play, I think, rings as much true today as, you know, in, in, in our world here with the, with the virus as it did then. And uh, he adopted this play. But I just wanted to read a little bit of, and this is the only one of the, uh, in, in the anthology, where he actually does write something before because he adopts the play. And he says, I had no interest in exhuming a play just for historical interest, but he says, what I wanted to do was really make it relevant to, um, to today's theater goers. And, uh, and this was in the 1950s, I think, that he adapted this play. Uh, he says, I believe the play could be alive today. Uh, he says, um, more personally, it is a question of whether one's vision of the truth ought to be a source of guilt at a time when a mass of men condemn it as dangerous and devilish. It's an enduring theme, in fact, possibly the most enduring of all of Ibsen's themes. He says, uh, can an organized society um, uh, countenance an individual uh, who insists he is right while the vast majority is absolutely wrong? So it's a theme that goes on, um, you know, uh, very, very much today. We see a lot of uh, the controversy over, uh, you know, things that are going on. Um, in one of the interviews that I had seen, um, 
on YouTube. And as I say, there are many, many, many interviews on YouTube. Uh, his plays were popular worldwide. He produced plays in Beijing. He had produced some of his plays uh, um, um, all over the world. And um, they were talking to um, an English critic at the time. Uh, England, of course, is um, you know noted for their playwrights, authors, uh, um, poets and so forth. And they asked the critic, you know, where do you think Arthur Miller ranks as far as uh, playwrights? And you're talking to a country, of course, that's noted for its playwrights. He says, well, first of all, there's Shakespeare. He says, and second, there's Arthur Miller. <laughs> so quite a compliment for him. Um, so just a little bit about him. Um, he was born in 1915 and he died in February of 2005. He won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. And he also, he, he, his awards are, are so numerous, I couldn't even list them. But one that stood out to me was that he also won what was called the Jerusalem Prize. Um, and if you've seen the movie Footnote, which was an Academy Award nominee several years ago, uh, they referenced that, um, you know, um, many, many times the Jerusalem Prize. Uh, he was married three times. Um, divorced two of the three times. Um, he was born in Harlem, New York. Um, Harlem at that time was a, um, and not as we know it um, more recently as being more of a black community, but was um, a community of, uh, um, of largely Jewish people who lived in, um, uh, in that particular area. Um, his father um, was of Polish Jewish descent. Um, his father is Isidore, had a very, very prominent women's clothing business and at one time had employed over 400 people. Um, uh, during the depression though, the entire uh, company went bankrupt and that formed a lot of Arthur Miller's, I guess, opinions as far as um, views toward capitalism and view toward the worker and things of that that we see in Death of a Salesman. Um, the family lost everything and they moved to Brooklyn. And there's one scene that particularly is striking to me in, um, in Death of a Salesman, where um, uh, Willie Loman, who is the main character, who is a salesman that's based on an uncle, apparently, of Willie Loman, or Arthur Miller, rather, at the time. Uh, he's uh, in a, in a, in a uh, small um, house, and the house now is being surrounded by these large buildings that's enclosing him in. And he feels like um, the whole world is changing around him. It's all enveloping him. And as he moved to Brooklyn, I think this is what happened, that they were moving to a smaller quarters compared to this uh, um, apartment that he had in Central Park West. Um, he describes in some of his interviews some of the jobs that he had had uh, it, while he was in high school in Brooklyn. He graduated high school in Brooklyn called Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and um, he, um, he worked on kind of odd jobs. And one of his jobs was a waiter in the Catskills, he said, for a very prominent hotel. And they don't name it, but he showed a picture that looked like it was Grossinger's. And he said he was probably the worst waiter in the world at Grossinger's. And he said they used to feed them probably the worst food so that if a person ordered something, um, they would feed the, the wait staff and help the worst food, like day two, three days old food that was they're going to throw out. Uh, so he said it was a tradition for the waiters as they went into the kitchen. If somebody ordered uh, the example he gives of two lamb chops, he said he would order three and he would scarf one down on the way and bring them the two to the table. Um, he also worked in a warehouse and one of his plays is based on his working in a warehouse. So he worked these odd jobs after high school or during high school uh, with, and he tried to save enough money and he saved eventually $500 and he went to the University of Michigan. Uh, and his goal there was, um, uh, he wasn't a very good high school student at all. Uh, he said he was a mediocre student and uh, he did play some sports. As a matter of fact, he had a football injury which kept him out of the army in World War II. Um, but uh, he majored in journalism at first and his real goal at the University of Michigan was to write a play so that he could win an award. And the University of Michigan had a very prestigious kind of an award and uh, over spring break one time, he wrote um, one play, um, which I think was called the Hapgood Award or whatever it's called. Uh, and he did win it and it was a $250 prize and he won it two consecutive years. And that kind of got him interested in, in, in plays and in playwriting. So he graduates in 1938 from the University of Michigan and he joined something called the Federal Theater Project. This was part of the WPA, you know, the project that uh, built roads and things like that to uh, employ people during the depression. Um, but they had other projects as well, murals for artists and uh, theater projects. Uh, Orson Welles was heavily involved in some of them as well. 
Uh, but in 1939, Congress stopped that project because they thought there was too much of a communist influence in the theater. So um, he was kind of out of a job. And he worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in that time period, which is around the same time that my father worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard was uh, very, very prominent in building uh, warships at the time. Um, and he also um, wrote radio plays. He was paid about $375 to write plays for the radio. Uh, and um, Jeff and Flo were on last night when I talked a little bit about Pride and Prejudice. He had written a script for Pride and Prejudice, a one hour script uh, based on the Jane Austen play. And I'll come back to that in, at the end if I have time. Uh, while he was at the University of Michigan, he meets a lady named Grace Slattery, you wanted to get that right, and a Midwestern Catholic woman. And the two of them are polar opposites and they fall in love. And they fall in love because they are each intrigued by the other's culture, apparently, according to him in his interview. She was looking for someone who was intellectual, someone who was totally different, and she was kind of defiant, and she being a Catholic, he was interested in her, sort of like in the Philip Roth, uh, you know, um, novels, um, you know, um, that, that he wrote about also with the, uh, the intrigue of the, um, you know, the Jew for the, the, the non-Jewish woman. Um, and they had two children together. Um, and at that time, he, uh, she is uh, uh, employed, she has a job, so she is financing a good part of their lifestyle. And he writes his first play, which is called The Man Who Has All the Luck. And that play won the Theater Guild National um, Award, and it closes after four performances on Broadway. So it's a total failure. The critics, many of the critics liked it, but the public apparently did not. Um, and he then uh, goes back and he writes a lot of radio scripts at the time uh, to support himself together with his wife. Um, but then his immediate success is um, he writes a play which took him quite a bit longer to write. He started it in 1941 and he finished it in 1947 uh, called All My Sons. And uh, this play now is... Uh, uh, you have to picture what's happening. After World War II, the world is really exuberant and it's celebrating and it's celebrating uh, the, um, the victories of, uh, you know, American and democracy. And he writes this play at a time now um, during this exuberance, uh, which basically says, you know, there were a lot of things that happened during the war that are really unseeding like. And one of them is this idea that a lot of people were capitalizing on the war and producing deficient goods. Uh, and the play is really about a, um, it was an incident that took place in Ohio uh, about a businessman who was making parts for aircraft planes, for aircraft, and he was knowingly selling and producing parts that he knew were deficient. And some of the planes actually crashed and the uh, pilots were killed. Uh, and um, the son actually, it's a story between a father and a son largely because the son eventually finds out that the father had been complicit in this, in his business and selling these deficient parts. And um, at the end, uh, there's this famous part and there's a movie with Edward G. Robinson, which is very good. All My Sons was just reproduced on Broadway. Um, and there's a scene there where he says, you know, and one of the people that was killed was one of his sons, the uh, manufacturer. And Edward G. Robinson, or the, uh, I forget who it was, Charlie Keller, I think is the name of the guy in the movie. He says, yeah, they were all my sons. Uh, so people were crying during that, uh, that particular play. I think it was at a time when, you know, we realized that, uh, you know, war has some very, very difficult aspects to it. Um, he, um, okay, so after that, that play really established him and won the Tony Award. Um, in 1948, he moves up to Connecticut and he was a woodworker and he loved woodworking and he built this little cottage, which is basically the size of a barn. And he starts writing a second play. And this turns out to be, he writes about three or four words to it. Uh, Hello, I'm there. And then he decides he wants to build a cottage outside of his house. And it's like a little shack and it's a pretty nice looking cottage actually. And that's where he basically completes Death of a Salesman in like six weeks. And Death of a Salesman, as I mentioned, is um, somewhat based on an uncle of his, but it really is one of the most human stories of all time. And probably it is my favorite play um, you know, of all time. And, and it's one that I watch over and over again or write over and over again and get something new of each time. 
Um, and that really established him as an iconic figure. Um, in 1956, he divorces Grace Slattery. So he's married to her from about 1940 to about 1956, and he has uh, um, these two children. Uh, in the meantime, in the preceding two or three years, uh, as a screenwriter, he had written some screenplays uh, before he wrote the famous one with Marilyn Monroe, Misfits. He actually had met Marilyn Monroe, and he has kind of an affair with her, but he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want to get divorced. Um, and uh, basically, um, in, 1950, in the late 1950s, after his amazing success uh, with Death of a Salesman and All My Sons, he, um, uh, he and his wife basically um, de looked at, see things differently and look different ways, whether he was becoming, as he says, more enamored with the success, um, maybe a little bit overblown. Uh, he, he takes some of the blame. He takes a little of the blame on her. But in other words, he and Grace Slattery finally divorced in 56. And he does end up marrying Marilyn Monroe, as everybody knows, for a brief period of time. Um, she is the star. I mean, she can't even go out of the house without being noticed. And um, so they do spend, uh, in his interviews, he talks about spending a lot of private time with her, which is what she relished. And she has a lot of demons. Uh, she'd grown up as a, um, a girl who had been abused in a family that was uh, totally neglected of her. Um, and uh, she had a lot of problems and she relished the idea of uh, someone who was a fatherly like figure, uh, as well as someone she could love, someone who took care of her. And during the year or two or three that he did spend with Marilyn, uh, his productivity was way, way, way down. And when asked about it, he says, yeah, he says, uh, I did spend a lot of my time really trying to care for her. Um, he writes a screenplay called The Misfits, which has in it not only Marilyn Monroe, but Clark Abel and uh, Montgomery Clift. It's about these guys that go out west and uh, are rounding up Mustangs. And uh, they're basically um, these wild horses that are um, on the plains there and they round them up and the idea is they're going to sell them for horse meat and things of that nature. Um, and at the end of the movie, Clark Abel uh, kind of sees his way that this is a wrong thing to do and uh, he, he releases the horses. Uh, but at any rate, during the filming of this, it was by John Huston actually was the director of that film. Uh, he, um, um, uh, he sees that Marilyn is really taking a serious downturn. Um, she, the demons are now even worse. Uh, she gets on drugs, uh, sleeping pills, uh, barbiturates, anything that you could think of. And um, he tries to cope with it a little bit, but he can cope with it. Um, the movie is tremendously delayed. Uh, he shows pictures of people just standing and sitting around uh, while they're waiting for Marilyn to appear on screen. Uh, she has to go to a rehab for a couple of weeks during the filming and so forth. And, and she is a total, total mess. Um, eventually, um, uh, she moves out uh, after the film is made and she goes uh, back and they do get divorced almost immediately after that. Um, while um, uh, I don't mean to sound like he's a womanizer, but he always seemed to have a woman who was around at that time. And um, so there was a photographer. It's very common to, um, to employ photographers during filming of things because uh, as a film ends at the end of one day, uh, some of you know about film, um, the photographers come in and they take pictures so that, um, for example, they want to know exactly what the set looked like, you know, at the end of one day. So what they start at the second day, they go back and they look at the photographs and they could put it. So there were photographers and these were for publicity as well. So there is this photographer um, and she uh, has an interesting story in herself because uh, she is the daughter of, she's German, and she is the daughter of someone who had been a member of the Nazi party. And he um, uh, eventually becomes um, 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 involved with her uh, and um, ends up marrying her as well. And I'm searching for her name. Um, and this becomes his third wife. Um, I'll find her name in just a minute. Uh, and um, I did want to mention uh, prior to that that um, uh, he, he has a very, very long relationship with Ilya Kazan and uh, who is a director on Broadway, producer and director of the film, of his plays. And uh, um, 
this relationship, uh, Kazan did uh, Death of a Salesman as well as he did um, um, All My Sons. Um, and um, at the time um, that he is involved with Marilyn Monroe, the House on American Activities Committee is um, become uh, very, very prominent under Eugene McCarthy in Wisconsin as a senator. And they're looking for communists under every, um, uh, under every stool in every, every particular place. And um, they're calling in a lot of um, the people that are associated more with Hollywood than with Broadway. And Kazan had had a lot of influence, um, you know, in making movies in Hollywood. And uh, Kazan um, comes and testifies in Congress, and he does name names of other people, which was thought to be a traitor. As a matter of fact, he tries to, and on the waterfront, if you see that one scene where they talk about the stool pigeon, where the Marlon Brando character, and then the, the kid goes up to the roof and he kills the pigeon, if you remember that one scene in it. Um, you know, I think Kazan puts that in to show that maybe he was the stool pigeon, but he did it for a good reason, as Marlon Brando did in, in On the Waterfront. But at any rate, it leads to a serious rift for many, many years because he feels, the, uh, Miller feels that Kazan had betrayed him. Um, he does write a play in 1964 called After the Fall, which basically talks about his marriage with Marilyn Monroe. Um, in 1968, he's a delegate to the Democratic National Committee, and he's a delegate for Eugene McCarthy, who was a pacifist, obviously, at the time. Um, in 1968, he writes another one of his really, really fine plays that I love very, very much called The Price, uh, which is a beautiful play about responsibility of parents and children. And it's a, a play that um, I've seen where um, um, the, the father has died and uh, his house now is full of all of these old things, um, furniture and uh, knickknacks and memories and things. And uh, the two sons who haven't seen each other come together to, um, and they hire this, um, this guy like a, um, you know, a, a pawnbroker kind of person to come in and to dispose of the goods in the house. And um, the two sons then it brings up all the bad memories of what has happened. And uh, one of the sons talks about, well, you know, he had sacrificed a good part of his life for the other son to become a prominent lawyer or something. And he says, you haven't paid the price. Uh, it's a play about responsibility of taking care of each other as a family, which you see so much in Death of a Salesman and so many of his other plays. Um, as I mentioned, he, he, he commented frequently on his works and you go to YouTube and find an enormous amount of stuff. Um, in the 1970s, he campaigned uh, for release of the Soviet dissidents. Um, in 1983, he produced and directed Death of a Salesman in Beijing. He also made the hit TV program uh, in which Dustin Hoffman plays Willie Loman, which is a really, really fine performance. Uh, um, it's still available. 1987, he writes a book called Time Bends, which is an autobiography in which he reveals a tremendous amount about his, uh, about his life. Uh, in 96, he wrote the screenplay uh, for The Crucible. The Crucible was obviously based on um, his feeling of what was happening during the McCarthy hearings um, where the House on American Activities was acting like the Salem witch trials. Um, he, um, his wife dies, um, the second wife who I'm trying to find who was the photographer, Inga Morath, uh, who he had met, obviously, the uh, first time during uh, the filming of The Misfits, uh, though he doesn't marry her until, you know, after he divorces, uh, obviously, divor gets divorced from Marilyn Monroe. Uh, well, he and Inga stayed together and, uh, and lived together until she passes away in 2002. Uh, and then in 2004, he reveals that he's been living with a much, much younger woman, a woman named Agnes Barley, uh, at his farm since 2002, since when his wife had passed away. So um, apparently he was never very long without female companionship. Uh, so when you look at Arthur Miller, you look at his legacy. Uh, 1979, American Theater Hall of Fame. 1984, Kennedy, and these are just a, a, a brief, brief synopsis of awards. 1984, Kennedy Center Honoree. 1993, the Four Freedoms Award, for freedom of the speech. 
Um, there's a minor planet named after him, number 3769. Uh, I don't know whether you paid to do these. Um, he started a foundation uh, for the certification of uh, teachers of the theater in the New York City area, uh, where they not only uh, provided money for a teacher, for people who wanted to become teachers for theater arts, but also to provide tickets for students to go to plays and see theater and all kinds of public arts um, uh, for New York City. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Leon Uris is donating his um, his uh, memoirs and his transcripts and his, his letters and things to uh, Rumson Center at the University of Texas. I was unaware of uh, how prominent that Rumson Center at the University of Texas is, but apparently um, um, uh, Miller donated almost all of his works to the Rumson Center as well at the University of Texas. So they have probably one of the largest collections there. Um, in all, he wrote 38 plays. Now we think of Miller as writing basically three, four plays that I could probably name, uh, but he wrote 38 plays, most of which were failures, to be honest with you. Um, they, they, they just never made it more than um, his reputation would have allowed. Uh, he wrote 13 plays or screenplays for the radio between 1941 and 47 when he was writing um, just to make money, just to stay alive. Um, he was writing, um, 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 all My Sons. Uh, he wrote seven screenplays uh, for the movies, most famous of which obviously is The Misfits and the screenplay, uh, I think Frederick March's in Death of a Salesman. And, uh, um, and he wrote six novels and short stories, including his autobiography. So um, quite a prominent guy, um, quite a voice for democracy, quite a voice for um, the person who is um, neglected and downtrodden, the Willie Loman kind of everyday man um, in society. Um, so uh, a pride to, to, to Judaism and a pride to, um, to democracy and to, um, to Jewish people as well. Thank you, Larry. And, and, and again, those were incredible authors, obviously. Um, Arthur Miller is a little different because the others are very Jewish transparently and write about Jewish things and they come from Jewish areas. And he is one of these, what we call more of an American playwright, just, and I don't think most people would even know he was Jewish and just one of these you know, great leaders from his. So just showing two very different kinds from Eli was well or, or Chaim Potak or Leon you know, we look at them as writing about Jewish issues, Jewish you know, differences and Holocaust reminders and isolation and, you know, acculturation. And then we have this man here who is completely kind of secular in many respects in terms of what he writes. I, mean, his last I think name. one of the main things that he would, he would pride himself on, I think he prided himself on that these were Jewish values. Right. And that is, I mean, he was personally that way, but... So he was very Jewish in his own way, but he made his money writing a crucible, which could be taken for McCarthyism, but also for a lot of other things. Death of a salesman, obviously, that could be for just about any culture. So he was really more broad, even though he was using a Jewish basis for it, I think. So incredible people. So I want to thank everybody again. I got to leave because my wife is borrowing this computer for Hadassah meeting. So uh, how that's a prep meeting. So I apologize again. So we're going to meet and if Farina, you don't mind sending it out. Uh, for September 30th, we'll do the second part of authors. If we'll need another one, we'll do it then. And uh, great job. So this was really, I think, really amazing to hear so much about these authors. Many, most of it, I didn't know. I mean, I knew that they wrote and some of the history, but I didn't know uh, half of what we talked about when it came to the authors themselves. So I think it was really nice to choose this topic because I know a lot about the crucible and I know, you know, the promise and, 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 and night, obviously, but in the Exodus, I didn't know as much about the individuals always. So, so I think it was a great job. Very nice, very interesting. And uh, Stuart, you're going to have a question. Uh, not a question, just a quick note. Uh, you mentioned the promise is what made me think of it. Uh, last night I saw on Netflix a movie called The Promise. It's a different movie, but it's about the Armenian genocide. It's a really good movie and sort of to me as the message as a Jew, you know what? It's not only us who have suffered this kind right. of thing. Terrific movie if you want to see it, The Promise on Netflix. 
And that, of course, would be some considered the first attempt at genocide before the Holocaust. So it's a, it's become much more, uh, you know, it's been brought up to the Turkish government in recent years. So it's become much more well known as the incidents. So thanks for bringing that up. So have a good one, everybody. Hopefully you can guys get sleep. I will start getting sleep as soon as my kids are adults and uh, Netflix goes under again. Because every time I turn around, they're releasing something else I want to say. So, so stay safe. My wife doesn't realize I actually, you know, read books before, you know, before the last year or so, and certainly before the last six months, I used to read a lot of books. Are you um, on a three today, Rabbi? A three? No, I am. I have taken myself off for the next three weeks. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We're, we're, the problem is we're filming for high holidays and editing, and I have to be at every session. Right. You got it. I didn't know, know if the film right. was over yet. The, the filming is over for everybody but me. We haven't done any of my filming. So that is going to take an incredible amount of time. And then we've got to edit everything. And we're talking 80 to 100 pieces of music, 80 people participating, you know, 13 services, everything from, we now turn to page 33, where we have to do a scene just for that. So it's really interesting to see how this all works. Rabbi, after this, you can become a movie producer and director. I could. I couldn't be an editor because the software, it actually, Jason brought it into the synagogue. So we now have the professional movie software being used in our synagogue, like the one they actually use for movies. So I get to watch him do all the stuff, which obviously I can't do, but it's really interesting for say, well, let's fade in there. Let's move this here. It's really kind of interesting. So hopefully it'll work out. If not, then I'll figure out again who will blame. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Thank safe, you. everybody. Right. And we'll Bye -bye. see you in a couple of weeks. Remember, Holly, Slichot uh, is this Saturday night. And then a week from Friday night is Erev Rosh Hashanah. So hope to see you guys. Okay. Right. Shana Toba. Shana Toba, everybody.